Well, hello and welcome to the broadcast. Good to have you with us on Victorious Faith today. And as we get started, I want to encourage you to download our free devotional. And uh, that gives you the chance to dig deeper, take notes during the shows. I really want to encourage you to write things down as they are ministering to you. I, I keep a running journal. I do both hard copy on paper, and then I have a digital uh, journal where I just write thoughts down that the Holy Spirit's quickening to me. And it's amazing. On, you know, as little as a day can pass, and I go back, and there's such an anointing on those things. Also, be sure to check out markcowart.org. There is a lot of teaching online available for you, and you can scroll through that and find things that will help feed your spirit, man. You know, I'm reminded Dr. Lester Sumrall was a huge influence in my wife and I's life, and I shudder to think if he had not been in our life. But he used to say something, and it stuck with me. A lot of things he said stuck with me, and still to this day, minister. But if you will feed your faith, You'll starve your doubts to death. A lot of people are fighting against doubt and all these kinds of things, but feed your faith and, and push that out of your life and the way that we do it is through the Word like we're doing now. And so we are in a series here talking about overtime. We're in overtime in the body of Christ. You know, I want to be real honest with you. Um, as I was coming in today to the office and we were going to be taping here, listening to current events, headlines, and there's something about it. We all know that we're in a difficult time in America. We all know we've got some unprecedented challenges with our government, with the church, that is the body of Christ, with our economy, with our borders. I could just keep going on down the line, but just listening to some things today, I feel in my heart we are in a place that if we do not see the hand of God and his intervention, we're in a very serious place. And there's a danger, I believe, in America because we've, you know, we're coming up on 250 years old and we're a young nation, but we've already exceeded the life cycle of nations. And, and normally, you know, there's revolutions, there's overthrows, there's new constitutions. Ours is the longest lasting constitution. It's the one thing that's always under attack because our constitution of the United States of America is the supreme law of the land. I wish I had a hard copy of the Bible to hold up because that's our constitution, so to speak, as believers, the Bible is the supreme law of the Christian believer's life. And we've already covered the fact that when a, when a football game, for instance, goes into overtime, <clears throat> it's the most critical time of the game because you don't have a lot of time in front of you. You don't have another four quarters or three quarters or two quarters out in front of you to catch up again. And it's like, everybody's tired and you get into a place <clears throat> where you understand that it could go either way. And we use the illustration of the game between 20 in 2024, the Super Bowl, where the 49ers and the Can Kansas City Chiefs, it was down to the wire, went into overtime, tied. And then <laughs> I say it this way, by the grace of God, because there's a prophetic thing tied to the Super Bowl, there was a turnaround, and then there was a scoring, and then it was over with. One of the things that, you know, I've said, I there's been generations before that, and actually denominations where there was a whole group of senior pastors that did not plan for the retirement and the denomination had to build living quarters for them because they thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Those men are dead, dead and gone, but <clears throat> they literally didn't plan for the future. So here's what I want to share with you in your own personal life. Um, be prudent in your daily walk with the Lord. You know, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I just feel like God told me this. And I said, well, when you run that through the filter of God's word, the word of God being the final authority in our life, it doesn't fit. 
because Proverbs principle says, I wisdom am found with prudence. What is prudence? Prudence is exercising sound judgment in practical matters. You know, I believe in divine protection. I believe you do too. But I hope you lock your doors at night. Uh, I hope you wear your seatbelt during the day. I hope you observe, you know, basic laws, driving out on public streets and things like that. You know, there's things where, you know, one of the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, um, when when the enemy came to him, the devil came to Jesus, and he said, you don't tempt the Lord your God. What does it mean to tempt the Lord your God? How do you tempt him? You know, and it's cast yourself down, for it is written, the Lord shall bear thee up, and angels will keep you from dashing your foot against stone. He said, don't tempt the Lord your God. What does that mean? Trying to force God's hand. People do that so often. You know, God gave me a word on this and and bless the Lord, I'm giving the Lord till Friday. And if it doesn't happen, then I'm gonna make something happen. I've watched more lives destroyed that way, staff members' lives, because they felt called to the ministry and they saw what God wanted to do with them, but it didn't happen in their time frame. And one of the most critical things you and I need to understand is we need to be prudent in our daily walk with the Lord, because that's where wisdom is found. And if people are not prudent, how can you claim wisdom when you're doing foolish things? So here's what I want to share in regard to that. You and I, this generation, we need to plan like the Lord's not coming for 100, 200, or 300 years. We need to be multi-generational. and But we need to live like the Lord is coming in our lifetime. And if you do that, Doesn't that strike us as being the wisdom of God? Because what if, by chance, the Lord doesn't show up in our lifetime? What if, you know, we've got many more years, decades, or centuries of God moving before he wraps things up? Then we're safe if we plan for multi-generational centuries down the line But then if we live with an urgency, like he's coming in our lifetime, that is a winning combination. So Amos chapter 9, verse 13, out of the Message Bible, I want to take us back there. And uh, this is something that in our prayer meetings around here, Pastor Calvin Johnson, who uh, is our Transformation Project pastor, he has shared this scripture out of the message, and I'll tell you what, this has been so powerful. He said, yes, indeed, it's, it won't be long now. God's decree, things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. One thing, fast on the heels of the other, you won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once. And everywhere you look, blessings, blessings like wine pouring off the mountains and hills. I'll make everything right again for my people, Israel. So America is God's nation, but the body of Christ, in my opinion, we've fallen asleep. While we slept, the enemy came in and sowed tears. We find ourselves just like ancient Israel did in trouble. They were a covenant nation and God is not done with Israel. But because of their disobedience, because of their sin, even though they were God's chosen people, the Lord kept warning them, if you keep doing this, you're going to have this happen, you're going to have that happen, and your enemies are going to come in, and it's going to affect your children, and your sin will be carried out, and that's where we are in America right now. So the good news is we serve a merciful God and a gracious God. So When you and I woke up this morning, his mercies were brand new. And the grace of God that has brought salvation has appeared to all men. That's why God commands us to repent. So one of the things that we learned is that we need to be busy about our Father's business. And so visiting once again, and remember, even though we may have talked about this in some previous broadcasts, repetition's the motor of learning, but I talk about recovering the two lost commandments. And really, it wasn't God that lost them, it's we, his people, because his word is his will. 
A lot of people say, I, I, I really want to know the will of God for my life. My first question in, in many cases is, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? Because if you're seeking to know the will of God apart from being in the Word of God, you're doing a foolish thing. First off, you, you must be in the Word of God. Now, here's my, one of my little soapboxes. If you're ever going to get the benefit of the Word of God, three things you have to do. Number one, you have to read the Word. Number two, you have to study the Word. And number three, you have to meditate the Word. Think of those three things like a stool that has three legs on it. If if you've only got two legs on it or one, it's really useless. It's a, it's a fruitless, useless waste of a piece of furniture. You need all three. And think of that when it comes to your Bible. And so my question is, do you read your Bible regularly? Read it regularly. Number two, do you study it? Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman or woman, that needeth not to be ashamed and rightly divides the word, which means in the Greek, cut a straight line through the word. Cut a straight line, rightly divide it. So you have to read, study, but then one of the most powerful things is, because this is where spiritual warfare takes place, is the word of God has to go from being read to being studied to where it becomes a meditation of your heart. Um. Going back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, um, basically I call it the master key of the kingdom of God. For instance, right now, you know, if I were to sit down and, and talk with you or you sit down and talk with someone, and let's say they're troubled and they like, man, I need help. I need to hear from God on this. And you tell me what you're thinking on. Tell me what your meditations are. And if you tell me that, what your thoughts and meditations of your heart and mind are, I can tell you exactly what is attacking you or what is moving in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. King David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5, he said, you know, though we walk in the flesh, that's not where our warfare is. Your boss is not your enemy. Your wife, your husband, your children ultimately are not your enemy. It is spiritual forces. Now, they may happen to uh, be working through some of those people mentioned. It may be another church member. It, it could be somebody you live next door to, but ultimately, there is a spiritual force influencing those people. But the fact of it is, demonic forces can't just come in and take a person over. They have to get cooperation from an individual before they can be utilized to take someone's life and begin to work through them uh, to bring about evil things or dark things. So how does that happen? It comes in thoughts. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody begins to think on something, and then they begin to meditate on it, and then it becomes a part of their thought processes. And the law of sowing and reaping says that whatever we sow, that we shall reap. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why am I bringing these things up? Because right now is the most critical time I believe to this point in the history of the body of Christ, we stand to gain everything or lose everything right now. Um, and, and what's important is that you understand you as an individual are a very important person. You can affect a change. You know, people, they struggle with this probably as a pastor for all the years that I have been now. One thing that always comes to the top of the list, people feel worthless or they feel unimportant. Uh, for instance, when a person is suicidal, that is one of the most counterintuitive acts a person could ever take, that they would take their own life because one of the strongest things that God put on the inside of us is self-preservation. And that's not a bad thing. 
unless we begin to preserve things that are destructive to us and what have you. But when someone is battling suicide, and I want you to know if that's something you're battling with, did you know that you can be totally free of that? Uh, man, I've, I've got so many friends that you know have either battled it personally, the loved ones and different things. And the only way a spirit like that can prevail is when someone doesn't gain the upper hand in their thinking. And so Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinketh, so is he. And so your thought life, everything begins and ends in a person's thought life. So one of the things that we realized, I, I was just thinking about the early days when my wife and I were in ministry, we didn't just think we were ill-equipped. We were ill-equipped. We had never, and this is not complaining, this is just factual uh, conveyance of what we inherited when we became senior pastors. So we had never had uh, effective leadership modeled to us in the way it should be done. When we started, I went back and checked it. When we began as senior pastors in the ministry, there, you know, John Maxwell's leadership books, there's millions in print. If you were to go to my library, you'll find several of his books in there, some really effective stuff on leadership that on one hand is so simple, but yet so effective. And, and, and so I went back when we started, there were no John Maxwell books. There were no leadership books like we have access to now. We can go on YouTube. We can download different books. We've got so much stuff. The biggest challenge we have today is focusing. There's so much good stuff out there that you can just get pulled in so many different directions. When we started in ministry, the term management and leadership were interchangeable. Um, in other words, there's a great deal of difference between leading and managing. It's been said that managing, or do, managing is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right thing. But leadership is what takes you forward. Management is the proper and effective handling of the increase that you have. Because if you don't, you have to have both, leadership and management working together. You can have an effective leadership or an effective leader in your organization, whatever it may be, with lousy management, you're going to suffer. You can have lousy leadership with effective management, you're going nowhere. And uh, one of my mentors in life was Dr. Dean, is Dr. Dean Radke. I mean, I shudder to think if, if I had not been able, Lynn and I both, to receive from him at 84 years of old, as of this taping, he's still effective. He's busier than ever. There's no slowing down. He does not know what the word retirement means. And one of the things that I look at in his life is that he took our lives and it went from theory into real life because of what God had used him in. And so one of the things that impacted me most about him, he was in the corporate world and structure and multi-billion dollar corporations and high torqued organizations, intense leadership and management required all that kind of stuff. But when he got saved, which he wasn't until he was in his 40s, he said, now if I can take these principles and in the world see billions of dollars generated what would happen if we applied those to the body of Christ and, and pastors could take these things and church staffs? Could we see an eternal difference in people being saved, discipled, brought into the kingdom? And the unique part of what he teaches is not just corporate leadership management, but discipleship, because we're lacking on discipleship. So these two lost commandments, back to these once again, remember these, that you have what I like to think of as these are the two bookends in my mind. The first lost great commandment is loving the Lord your with God with all your heart. So let's go to the scripture in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. Now I'll read it out of the New King James Version, but he said, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
This is the first commandment, or the greatest, the most important commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, this is interesting, and I hope you'll embrace this with me because many people's difficulties and challenges in their life as a Christian right now is because they do not understand. You know, the Lord doesn't just give us things to do thinking like, well, you know, they look a little bored right now. I think I need to give them a commandment. This is the love of God and the wisdom of God expressed through his word. And what Jesus is saying is this is the most important commandment. This is the chief, greatest, most important commandment of your life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And that's the Greek word, cardia. And, uh, you know, think of it. There's people, and we need to clarify these things, like, you know, someone... A husband tells his wife or a wife tells her husband, I love you with all of my heart. Well, that's good. But actually, it's the Lord your God that you need to love with all your heart and you can more effectively love your spouse. But then let's say this. We hear people say, well, I love my dog. Well, I love my dog too. <laughs> but sure hope you love your dog, uh, love your, your God the most high God, more than you do your dog. And people say, I love apple pie, or I love this, or I love that. So we throw these words around. But when Jesus uses the word love, it's not a brotherly love. It's not a familial love, which I think is a Greek word, storge, or, or phileo, which is a brotherly love. It is the word agape love. And it is a love that's not based on feeling. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I fell in love or I fell out of love. Agape is not something you fall in or out of. It is something you decide to do. Agape love is the love of God. It is actually love as God has it. So think of this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There was nothing warm and fuzzy about the love that God had. I, I've often thought on this, it had to be painful for him that this creation, he created this beautiful world that we live in. He created Adam and Eve. He created the entire world, spent all these days working on this place for, for mankind to inhabit. And he said, Adam, I'm giving you dominion. This is yours and we'll walk together, but it's yours. I'm giving you everything. It's You have dominion over this. You'll rule, you'll reign. And the serpent came in, Lucifer disguised, now becomes Satan, deceived Adam and Eve, and Adam committed high treason and gave that authority over to Adam and Eve. And what happened? God is now on the outside looking in and he has to find a way to get back in to redeem his man or buy him back. And it took the cross, the death, the burial of Jesus, being raised from the dead, getting that authority back. You think about the pain that the Lord had to go through. We have almost 6,000 years God's been dealing with mankind, different dispensations. The Old Testament records all this. Think of the rebellion that God's had to put up with. Any of you that have had an unfaithful spouse, been betrayed by family members or been betrayed by other Christians or ministers or things, any of those can't even compare with what God has gone through with the uh, the human race. And it's the love of God that's kept him focused. And, and what Jesus is saying here is, now you're to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, everything in your being, no matter if you understand what's going on right now or can't understand. If it seems like that God is not listening to you or he's silent or things haven't turned out like you want them to, you continue to love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's a quality decision from which there's no retreat. Then he goes on and says, love the Lord, your God with all your soul. And that is basically, that's the Greek word psyche, which we get the word psychology. 
And that's a, that could be a lifetime study in itself. And that is your mind, your intellect, your will, and your emotions. You know, so I've talked about when I got in ministry, I was like fascinated at human behavior. And it could be so frustrating. I joke about it. So I started studying about human behavior, the soul, the mind, everything. And uh, I tell people that because I was so fascinated with people, how they would do stupid things, ridiculous things, or great things. But I said, my own behavior intrigued me the most. Have you ever wondered, why do I do that? Why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? And it's because it's the area of the soul, the psyche. And I had a friend of mine, I was on his broadcast recently, and he introduced me and he said, Mark could almost be a psychologist. And uh, first off, I've never sought that or pursued it. The reason that I look back in hindsight is because if I'm going to love the Lord, my God, with all my soul, my mind, will, and emotions, I need to understand some things about myself. And what I want to do right now, I want to pray over us, and we'll pick up on the next broadcast where we left off, because this, is, this will solve so many things. Father, I pray over the people listening today, and I pray, Lord, for your word that has been sown, and for any understanding that has come, that, Lord, they'll lay hold of that and that it will come to full fruition in Jesus' name, amen. And if you would like further ministry and prayer, there's a telephone number on the screen here, and I encourage you to call. Our prayer ministers are standing by right now. They would love to pray with you, speak with you. And also, remember your thought life. That's where spiritual warfare ends and begins. Go to markcoward.org. There's a series on mind renewal that I did there, and I'll do a deep dive on that. And it's on our website. And I encourage you, go to my YouTube channel, like it, and share it with others. And if anything you're studying seems to quicken and somebody comes to mind, that could be the Holy Spirit that's quickening you to send it to them. And it may be just what they need to hear. So... I want to thank you for joining us on the broadcast today. I'll see you on the next one. Till then, may the Lord's richest blessings be yours. Thank you for joining Pastor Mark today. Our prayer is that this teaching, which is full of God's word, would strengthen you. Before you go, we want you to know that we have a free devotional download to go along with this series. This has been prepared for you so that you can dig deeper as you receive fresh revelation, grow in your faith, and experience wonderful breakthrough in your life. Did you know that you can access even more messages from Pastor Mark on YouTube? Just search Mark Howard Ministries. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're informed every time we upload something new. This is also a great way to share your favorite Pastor Mark messages with others. Thank you for being a part of today's broadcast.